one of the things that we took very seriously on the first day, if we were going to step out of our comfort zone and build a product, it had to have some synergy. It had to have proximity to our end customer, which had its foundations and its beginnings in law enforcement. And the opportunity to sort of mess that up, right, would, would not have been something we could have recovered from. For that reason, we didn't try to build a $40 knife. We didn't try to use imported components. We, we took the challenge seriously to really protect that Hogue brand, which is our lifeblood. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkies. Welcome to episode number 47 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. Another good one coming up for you today. We've got an interview as well as a couple of tidbits of uh, stuff we want to talk about here first. Uh, I guess the uh, the real stuff part of it uh, has to do with a cold steel, cold steel sword. You want to talk about that? Yes. You want to try saying that three times fast first, but you want to talk about that first? Yeah. Uh, so it was my, uh, my brother-in-law's 40th birthday yesterday. He's got me a lot of cool knives in the past. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what we give each other as gifts. And uh, I figured this was a big one. And every house needs a sword somewhere, right? Hanging on the wall or just by the bed. So I got him a cold steel 1796 light cavalry sword. And it showed up right before we left for the party. And I pulled it out and took the grease off, you know, packs with in grease and stuff like that. I cleaned it up and put it in the sheath. And it is so cool. It is it is amazing. If anyone's ever wondered about the cold steel swords, uh, their historical reproductions, I got to say, this thing, uh, we, we played around with it a little bit uh, at his party before the drink really flowed. And uh, I got to say, it's very stout and sturdy and light and probably made better than the originals uh, back in the day. So, uh, yeah, just a very cool little uh, thing to have. Nice that you tested it out and played with it before the drink started flowing. I think yes. you learned your lessons. I learned the, my lesson <laughs> on my 42nd birthday, that that's, that's right. the order of things. Right. <laughs> and uh, and I, I know I have a long way to go. I'm a, I'm a knife newbie on my road to becoming a knife junkie because I don't have a sword hanging in my bedroom. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, Jim, uh, you know, you have <laughs> birthdays and Christmases coming up and who knows. Things to shoot for. <laughs> exactly. Hey, but also uh, you want to talk about some, uh, what, new products from Benchmade or something? Yeah, yeah. I was looking at uh, Knife News and uh, saw that they're coming out with two new uh, knives right now. One of them is a new model altogether. It's It's called the Autocrat. It's an automatic uh, out the front double edged you know dagger style uh, but the unique thing about this is that it's uh, it's all g10 construction uh, there's no aluminum in the handle it's uh well it's just a different kind of construction but it's it kind of in the along the lines of the uh, of the infidel and, and their other out the fronts so I thought that was a, an interesting uh, way to handle the uh, oh to handle that was a pun interesting way to handle uh, the out and a new out the front is to make right. it lighter with composite materials and stuff and then the other thing that came out from Benchmade is on the opposite side. Like, I totally get why they came out with the Autocrat. On the other side is uh, they, they have this new gold class. Gold, their gold class of knives are, are their high-end knives. They use different materials, you know, high-end materials and such uh, to fancy up models they already have. And so they are now doing the Crooked River gold class. And it's got uh, Damascus bolsters and the unidirectional nice-looking carbon fiber almost looks like wood. And it's got a 20 CV steel blade, which is an upgrade, of course. Um, so it sounds nice. Sounds like a nice crooked river. And they're selling it for over a thousand dollars. It's like it's like twelve hundred bucks. Oh my god! Yeah, it's insane. I don't, I I don't get how they justify such a gigantic price jump. I mean, you want to buy the you want to buy the regular full size crooked river. You're gonna pay two hundred bucks. You want to get it with a Damascus bolster, twenty CV steel, and carbon fiber, and it's like twelve hundred bucks. That's crazy. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'd love to get someone from Benchmade on and just talk to them anyway, just to talk about the history of the company and and, and all that. But I, well, I, I, w- I would have to. There's your invite. <laughs> yeah, there's your invite. What the hell, man? I, I would I would be interested to find out how they justify such a huge price jump. I mean, do they do they resurrect uh, Hephaestus, the great god of the forge, and have him make it, or or what? I don't get it. Okay. Well, you lost me there, but <laughs> <laughs> the Greek god or whatever. Yeah. You're, I mean, you're more it, into that than I am. So, uh, in other words, you know, 
it might cost fifteen hundred dollars to roust him and have him make a bench made. I'm just curious, man. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Well, uh, after you buy yours, you, you can, <laughs> oh yeah, you can, did I mention it's on the way? <laughs> you can do a video review of it uh, for the Knife Junkie YouTube channel. And by the way, nice little transition here. If you want to subscribe to the Knife Junkie's YouTube channel, uh, just go to theknifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. That's for YouTube subscribe, theknifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. And that'll uh, get you subscribed to the Knife Junkie's YouTube channel so you don't miss any videos. And he is still going strong with a collection. Collection selections. Uh, you about to run out of knives yet for the collection uh, selection? No, nowhere near running out of <laughs> knives. But uh, I did sell two knives today. Two knives that I like a lot. Uh, I sold them this weekend just in preparation for that that mystery custom knife. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that's, that we'll talk more about later. Yeah, just trying to trying to build up that uh, that PayPal savings account so I can yeah. blow it all on this. Well, this it's other it's thing. not a first for you, but this, these are among the first several knives that you sold. So you're really getting into the reduce and refine part. Yeah, well, I, I tried to sell these two uh, for a couple of weeks. They didn't go. I put them. I realized I had them priced kind of high, and then I put them back out. They they were snapped right up. It was the, uh, the my my new native chief. I sold I sold the Spiderco native chief before I was able to put any damage on it. Um, I love it. It's so it's a great knife. But right now, I I just have to figure out knives to cut so I can get a couple of these uh, grails coming. Well, we've got a uh, good interview coming up for us today. But first, I want to remind you that uh, one of our sponsors of the Knife Junkie podcast is an app for your smartphone, and it can save you money, get your cash back into your account. It's called the Get Upside app. It's a way to get cash back on gas purchases, something that we all have to do every week, every few days, depending on how much we drive. Get Upside app is an app you put on your smartphone whenever you need to purchase gas. Just search your area, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then all you got to do is take a picture of the receipt with your phone. It's that easy. You get cash back. So if you don't have the app yet, get it at thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Again, thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Bob, you've talked to a lot of uh, knife makers, knife designers, all that kind of stuff in our podcast so far, but today is a Kind of a first for us? Well, yeah, I'm speaking with Jim Bruins of Hogue. Uh, Hogue started making gun grips and and other uh, accessories for firearms, and they've been around for 50 years. And about 10 years ago, or maybe a little bit more, through a chance meeting, uh, Jim Bruins, the man I'm speaking with uh, today, got the idea through a, through a chance meeting to start making knives. And uh, he um, he enlisted Alan Elishowitz, and uh, man, it's They've been going gangbusters for the last 10 years. And it was great to talk to to Jim and get his perspective. Like you said, I've spoken to a lot of knife makers and it's really uh, it was really interesting to speak to someone who is, a you know, a captain of industry who's gone into uh, knife, you know, the, the knife production world and just to get his take on it. You know, someone who hasn't been a knife guy from birth getting mm-hmm. into it. And uh, it was an it's an excellent story. It's kind of an, uh, an American dream story. Well, that's what we try to do here on the Knife Junkie podcast is bring different perspectives, different views, kind of different, uh, you know, thoughts about the knife industry. And if uh, go ahead and mention this before we get into that interview with Jim, if you uh, would like to be on the Knife Junkie podcast or, you know, someone who you think might be a good guest, why don't you call the listener line? Leave us a message at 724-466-4487, 724-466-4487. Let us know if there's uh, anybody you think uh, we should interview and uh, get some perspective on. And we have received some suggestions so far, and I have reached out to a, a few of the people that have been suggested. So please do that. It, it's a uh, it's great for me too because it gives it opens up my view of you know people out there that I that I haven't exposed myself to. So right, uh, yeah, definitely uh, send your suggestions. All right, episode number forty seven of the Knife Chunky Podcast, Jim Bruins of Hogue. Coming up next. Ever start looking for your next knife purchase before your last purchase has even arrived? Then you're probably a knife junkie. I'm here with Jim Bruins of Hogue Incorporated. Jim, thank you for, so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Well, Bob, thanks for having me. I enjoy it very much. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, in the last um, several months, I've been exposed to Hogue knives. I've always had a Hogue grip on my Glock, but uh, I was exposed to Hogue knives uh, just kind of by happenstance. And uh, I have fallen in love with them. 
I have an EX01, uh, I have a uh, an RSK Mark 1, and I have the uh, the new Tomahawk, which is amazing. How did Hogue, which was uh, uh started off as a as a gun, you know, company that makes fixtures for guns, how did how did you get into knives? Well, that's a great question and uh I think you you may have heard a little bit of the story, but about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I was at a a birthday party. It was actually a 50th birthday party of a guy by the name of Jim O'Young, who is a competition shooter whom we sponsored for probably about 20 years. And at that party was Alan Elishowitz. And as guys do when they get together and start spinning yarns, uh, Jim O'Young himself actually popped the question. He said, well, how about you guys get together and make a knife? And I thought, well, stranger things have happened. So Alan and I got talking about it, and before the evening concluded, we hashed out this idea to, to, to you know, try a flagship product and just see where it goes. So what was the flagship product? What was the first knife that you made? Well, technically, um, if I were t- to back up, there was he was in the middle of a project where he was trying to build um, sort of a, a mid-tech version of something he called the tank, and that later became the EX-02. And as we talked about that project, we weren't really quite sure whether we were going to build him a mid-tech and he was going to sell it as an Elishowitz mid-tech, or Hogue was going to do a whole knife. And he, at some point through the process of introducing us to to his tank model, which is a custom, uh, he just sat down and did what artists do, and he drew up a whole new knife. And that became the EX-01, which the name for the EX-01 was probably the biggest challenge. But when I got the original artwork from Alan, I was I was very impressed, very excited. I really wanted to build that knife. And I think the thing that was the, the best part of it was that it was a ground-up, start from scratch, make every component of the knife, hmm. capture all of the responsibility for the whole product. Sometimes when you get into building pieces that go together in, in somebody else's assembly, you know, the the inevitable finger pointing starts and this part doesn't fit with that part and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So the opportunity to build the EX-01 was exciting for a lot of reasons, mostly because we could capture all of the quality aspects and and learn as we went, try to understand mechanisms. We had a lot of, you know, background in, in steel and a lot of background in machining and tooling and fixturing and all the things associated with production manufacturing. But the idea to build a whole new product, uh, that was very exciting. So as I said, the name was hard. And we were, at the time, we were building a product, aluminum grips and G10 grips for pistols. And we dubbed that series, unlike wood and rubber, which are kind of our flagship products, we dubbed that uh, product line Extreme Series Grips. Hmm. So sort of EX, you know, Extreme, and then we thought, well, that would be really cool to incorporate that into the knife naming, because as you as you probably are aware, naming a product is very difficult. So EX solved a lot of problems, EX01, potentially EX02, EX03, and it's just sort of deferred the whole responsibility for coming up with a cool name. Yes, yes. And and it has it has the sort of uh, official sort of utilitarian ring of like SR seventy one or A ten or whatever it is. And you can always tack onto it, you know, EX and continue up. I think that uh one of the things about the EX03 that uh, I noticed right away was how crisp uh the detent is on this push button uh, this uh, button lock knife. It's its kind of a rare thing. Uh, what else about Elishowitz Designs uh, reeled you in? Oh, gosh. You know, I think it was a marriage. Um, you know, I could talk for hours about this, but I would say, you know, Alan is an artist, right? So he's a student. He's a student of many things. Um, martial arts, obviously. I know he has a liberal arts degree. The guy draws... Um, I'm surprised he doesn't write rock and roll songs, right? So he's, <laughs> he's, he's quite a creative guy. And he had that background. He had the real understanding of knife making. Um, when that guy decides to marry materials to this particular art form, the product of what he does, as you know, is, is really a work of art. But the background has all of the, the, the needs of cutting edge and 
balance and weight, and um, whether it's in, in a, a typical standard hold or reverse hold, a fighting hold, uh, whatever Alan decides uh, at the beginning of one of his creations, that is followed all the way through to the to the completed product. So you know the EX03, it, it's a button lock. Uh, to your point, the detent is is very well done. Somewhere in the in the marriage of Elisowitz and Hogue, we took our manufacturing techniques. We mastered the interface between the button detent and the face of the blade, and then we reproduced it. And that's really what we bring to the table. We're master machinists and tool and die makers. Hmm. So um, while a lot of guys, particularly the, the custom guys, they'll hand fit everything. And when they're finished, it's right. But now go do that 10 more times, identically. Now go do that 100 more times, right. identically. So I appreciate, uh, you know, the praises and the accolades. We actually work pretty hard at this. So it's just, it's just precision machining and quality control. So you're talking about capturing all the quality, um, in house. Does that mean you make everything from the, uh, from the screws to the pivots to all the pieces? Is that, uh, is that everything made in house? Certainly somebody will catch me on this. And, you know, we, we buy domestic materials. <laughs> Um, I will admit we do not make screws. Now, we could make the screws. We do yeah. have screw machines in our arsenal. But we make the pivot pins. We make the pivot pin screws. We make the buttons. We make uh, virtually every other component, not including assembly screws. Right. So I have the uh, the EX-03. And I am, uh, I'm ordinarily a, um, I love aluminum handles. Uh, but I, I went for this first as it was my first Hogue knife. And I'm really impressed by this composite material. It seems different from Grivery and GRN and the other kind of, uh, F uh GFN. Yeah. And, and the FRN other. RN. <laughs> yeah. All of those. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It, it seems a lot more dense, even though it's like very light and it seems very strong. Uh, the material itself just seems more dense. Um, is this, is this a product that you would ordinarily use on a rifle stock or something? Oh, no. No, not at all. Um, but you are, you are right. It's, you know, the FRN material, that's fiber reinforced nylon. And most you know, grivery, most of those, uh, you know, handle or scale materials are some, uh, form of glass reinforced nylon. Whereas the EX03 is made out of something called polyphenylene sulfide. That's a much more rigid material. It's actually a, a, a much higher heat material. Mm. And I, I did select it because, you know, sometimes a utility product, any tool, can wind up in the trunk of the car or the dashboard or in any one of a variety of different places. And if I really got into what happened when we built that particular knife, we invested a tremendous amount of engineering in it to make that thing work in a way that uh, gave rise to a high yield in production. We we really can't afford fallout. We we don't work on the, the worst margins in the world, but you know our margins are pretty tight. And one of the places we can really lose control is in production. Mm -hmm. So when we chose that material, we knew that it would be very stable in the cooling process. It doesn't tend to warp. Um, nylons and glass-reinforced nylons are also fairly stable. Uh -huh. But when you're cooling them in production, you really want those bearing surfaces to remain parallel as much as possible. We, we take and machine stainless steel bolster plates and we literally mold them in. So we load these stainless steel bolster plates into an injection mold. That mold then closes and we shoot this polyphenylene sulfide. It's about a 600 degree Fahrenheit melt temperature material. Hmm. Very, very hot. And then the mold, the mold closes. It opens up. The part spits out. And what we like about it, no assembly screws. There was a pivot pin screw, and we had to get a little resourceful about the stop pin, how we install the stop pin. And by the way, it ought to have a spring in it, so we had to figure out how to get a spring in there. Do you mean um, to make the auto version of it? Correct. Okay. Right. right. So, so are you saying that the the um, the manual versions already have accommodations made for a spring, so you only have to make basically one model, and then you can you can fit the other with the spring if need be? Is that well, you know, 
Somebody once did suggest to me that if we just put pockets in the face of the blade to receive a spring, and if we just put pockets in the bolster plate to receive a spring, we wouldn't necessarily have to put a spring in it, and we could uh, make our bolster plates and our blades universal. So that sounds like a great idea. We do some of that, but most often if you take that knife apart, the manual version will not have a spring pocket, and the bolster plate will not have a spring in a, in a manual version. But we could do that. Right. That probably sounds like the uh, prudent legal decision you know, <laughs> yeah. with, with something like that. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Hogue is uh, celebrating 50 years. You've been uh, in business for 50 years. It's a family-started business. Uh, tell me a little bit about the background of Hogue. Right. So roughly 1968, Guy Hogue was nearing retirement. He was actually, he ran the property division at, at one of the precincts in, in Los Angeles as a police officer. But he also spent time on the range, and he contributed as a range officer to training cadets. And, you know, there's there's some stories about, you know, getting through Guy Hogue at the range in order to earn your, your right to become a police officer. And one of the things that Guy, he was a craftsman. The guy made everything. He made he made literally the, the family camper that the family took on vacation. Wow. He, built it all himself. So when he noticed on the range that some of the cadets were struggling uh, qualifying, he, he went a couple of steps further into seeing exactly what was happening. And what he noticed was that the standard issue revolver in those days had grip panels screwed in from the side of the frame, and they would shift under the force of recoil. So Guy thought, well, if I make a single piece grip, and I screw it in from the bottom and tension against uh, what is called the, the, the loop of the frame, that grip's not going to move. So that's what he did. And that invention was received by cadets and pretty soon by beat cops. And pretty soon after that, there were precincts all over the country that heard about this. And before he knew it, he had a mail order business. So he made custom grips. And that that product was called the Mono Grip. And it really did revolutionize the way a grip installs onto a gun frame. And in fact, the shooting scores immediately improved from all the cadets and all the standard duty cops that use that product. Fast forward, Guy retires and moves the family to a beautiful place in Cambria, California, and and he became, uh, you know, as I said, a mail order business. He would then haul a trailer around to to various gun shows and shooting competitions, and that went on for about a decade. And somewhere in the late seventies, early eighties. His two sons, first first Aaron, took over and became vice president of Hogue Grips. And then he carried the company a little bit further forward and got into molded grips. He wanted to expand the production. And that's how I met the family. I was a student at Cal State trying to become a, an engineer, and I was actually serving a tool and die apprenticeship in a shop in Huntington Beach, California. In about 1982, when Guy Hogue and Aaron Hogue walked into our little tool and die shop, and asked us if we could make a gun grip mold because they wanted to expand from from wood grip making to plastics, and then ultimately it became overmolded grips. And once we got into rubberized or overmolded grips, the company really started to see exponential growth. So to meet that demand, all of a sudden we were building molds for, I mean, literally a thousand different handguns. So the need for a dedicated tool and die business arose in, in 1993. I moved my, my family out of Southern California, and we came up to the central coast of California. And a few li- years later, Hogue Tool and Machine was born, which I'm president of. Fast forward to about 2000, oh, I guess it was 09 maybe, when I went to that birthday party with Jim O'Young and Alan Olishowitz, and we decided to get into knives. So that's, that's kind of a brief history of how that all came together. Well, I think that was a good decision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, what What are your observations about the difference between operating in the firearms market and operating in the knife and the knife market? You know, they're they're very much the same. They're they're very similar. There are craftsmen. There are major manufacturers. There are wholesalers and dealers. As you know, there are internet retail stores, um, and and there are a lot of um, you know, similar uh, characters. Uh, there are very passionate people. There are there are utility users. 
I would say, in, in both industries. Obviously, there's some crossover. I will say there, you know, there is an elite, there's a very elite network of, of knife guys. This is a, a band of extremely talented craftsmen who, who have a passion. There is a faction of those guys in the firearm side as well. You might call them gunsmiths, you know, and there's the, these elite gunsmiths that are extremely talented hmm. and passionate. Uh, but it, the knife community, I, I, I can't really quite put my finger on the difference, but it's different. Maybe you could shed some light. I mean, you, you run in those circles too, right? Yeah, um, not so much in the, in the gun uh, world. Uh, but I, I can speak, uh, my observations of the knife world is that it's a very congenial, uh, and enthusiastic community. I, I, I feel like people are anxious to socialize with one another over this topic. I'm also, uh, I've also done martial arts in my life and it's kind of the same sort of attitude. Get two martial artists together and they'll talk forever about the intricacies of this and that. It's the same thing with knife enthusiasts, I find. Um, now, I don't know how that is in the gun world, but I suspect it's the same. You know, it's, it's people who are, you know, enthused about a certain kind of thing, you know, it certainly draws um, more men. I guess men are more interested in things, you know, women are more interested in people on the whole, but, but there is a crossover too. And, uh, so I feel like the knife community is a pretty generous and open place. That's been our experience. Um, you know, there's, there's always a question of, is this new product venture, and by that I mean knives for Hogue, mm-hmm. is this new product venture compatible? It, you know, are we, are we sticking to our knitting? Are we stepping outside of our wheelhouse? And some of those questions have yet to be answered. Mm-hmm. But I will say as a whole, the knife community, for the most part, has accepted us and embraced us and has measured us on our product. And we really can't ask for anything more than that. Speaking of your product, my, my impression is, uh, of, of a, of a reasonably priced, super high quality American made product. To me, that's, uh, um, you know, that's, that's not something that's easy to come by. Usually, uh, something in there has to give, and it's usually price. If you want the super high quality, uh, all made in house, uh, knife, you're gonna pay more than, I don't know. Your your knives seem reasonably priced. They're not they're not stupidly low, but they're not stupidly high. And um, well, I, I wanted to ask you about the the RSK one uh, Mark one, the Doug Ritter knife. I just got it, and I am so so enthusiastic about it. It is an amazing knife. I never had a, a Benchmade Ritter Griptilian, but um, man, this thing's amazing. Well, you know, the opportunity to work with Doug and certainly his reputation, I think, is is uh, among the highest, uh, not just in the knife industry, but I think as a person. You know, Doug carries himself with the utmost integrity. He's very passionate. He He's done everything from, from new home construction to uh, supporting uh, policy and rights for pilots uh, in the general aviation community. He has contributed to, to survival products for, I, I think, over 20 years. And now he's fighting the good fight uh, mm-hmm. under, the, under the, the activities of knife rights. So, you know, not only did we already respect what he had done with the Griptilian, but we've been supporting him and knife rights for, oh, seven or eight years now. So when Doug came to us and said, I, w- I won't say Doug said, hey, we need your help. But Doug said, you know, I need somebody to help me. <laughs> <laughs> and so we said, well, I, 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 think, I think we're up to it. So uh, Doug and I sat down, and on a handshake, we decided to take the opportunity to, to pick up where Benchmade left off and, and build the RSK-1. And uh, Doug's a little persnickety, so it took <laughs> us a little time. <laughs> and so is Alan, by the way. Well, as, um, as they the, should be, right? As, as they should be, right? They really, they really hold us to a standard that, uh, I think rises to the, to the, the integrity of, of those designers. Uh, so we were up to it and we took that on and thank you for your compliments. Uh, my, my staff will appreciate that very much, Bob. 
since I never had the uh, the Menchmade Ritter Grip, uh, I can't make a direct comparison, but I will tell you what I love about this. Um, you know, not only is the 20 CV blade just gorgeous and, and relatively thin and has that high flat grind and is just so incredibly slicey and sharp. So, I mean, the, the, uh, the blade performs beautifully, but this handle is a little longer. It seems like proportionately slightly longer and it just fills the hand in a, the contours, the outer contours fill the hand in a way, uh, that it feels a little bit more complete to me. Uh, than, than perhaps it was before. And then this, uh, gorgeous sunburst pattern that's milled into the, into the contoured, already contoured G10, uh, is super grippy and looks amazing. And the, uh, the slabs of G10 are nice and thick. There's no, there's no question that it's sturdy. So nicely done. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and all the praises to Doug as well. He actually camped out here in our engineering offices in Paso Robles, California, for several days and, and worked directly with some of our CAD modeling guys, and we got every last detail worked out. And we're very happy, very happy with the outcome. Uh, the ABLE, the ABLE lock, what is the, uh, what are the enhancements uh, that you bring forth with the ABLE lock? So William McHenry invented the axis lock some 22 years ago, and Benchmade had the very good uh, luck to, I, I don't know if, if Bill McHenry was on their payroll at the time, or however that came to be, but let's just pay homage to, to Bill McHenry and, and the whole engineering staff at Benchmade. They really knocked one out of the park with that thing. So over time, uh, that thing became synonymous with an ambidextrous lock, and, and I, I don't really think I've ever seen anything that will match it. So their patents did expire, uh, due in part to, to Doug and, and asking us to, to take this project on. It had to have this particular lock. So Doug actually came up with the name ABLE. It stands for Ambidextrous Bar Lock Enhanced. Mm -hmm. I would say that we did nothing special over what Benchmade did other than trying to be loyal to fits and tolerances in such a way that they pass our final QC inspection. Hmm. With some exception, every once in a while something gets out, it's a customer service issue, we take that knife back, we immediately replace it, but I want every RSK1 that leaves our facility to feel like what you are describing. So it's about fit and finish, tolerances, and an accept. So what I'm saying is any other access lock can be made to do that. Well, there is a, a a real solidity, but when this blade is locked open, it feels solid in a different way. I just have to say, I'm not, not going to draw comparisons, but it feels really solid, and there's no blade play at all side to side. And sometimes you experience that if you want a uh, uh, the axis lock to be nice and loose so that it flips open easy and 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 kind of falls shut. Sometimes you sacrifice a little blade play. Uh, haven't experienced that with this. Well. Thank you again. You're going to pull on my sensibilities in a moment because as a tool and die maker, um, I can get pretty persnickety myself. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to start walking through the factory, checking each it, one. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, you know, I, I, I have a lot of friends in, in the manufacturing industry, both in the firearm side of things as well as in the knife side of things. And there is a certain, oh, a prima donna aspect behind the guys that really care. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for noticing, and we'll we'll try to keep up the good work. You call me a prima donna? <laughs> <laughs> not, not you, the the craftsmen. Yeah, uh, I, the builders. Yeah. Oh, I got you. Right, right, right. You cannot. Yeah, don't let it out the door if it's not perfect. And and you know, if your name's going on it, I I can understand that. So you've got a, a new knife. I've seen uh, a couple of. Um, sort of first impression video videos on YouTube from my, some of my favorite reviewers, the DECA. And, um, it's a really cool looking design. I love, it's a clip point. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, it's a clip point. I think it's what, like three, three and a quarter inch blade. And it's got a really cool looking G10 handle. It looks kind of like, kind of like a, uh, a, a water stained green handle. It's really neat looking, uh, with the, uh, with the able lock. And I heard someone refer to it as bug out killer? Question mark. 
So uh, one of the things we do as a manufacturer is we listen to the customer. So um, uh, anybody can speculate as to what drives our design intent. Um, Alan actually delivered us the first design for what is now the DECA, um, and he called it his M2. And the M2 is identical to this knife, but a little larger. So once again, we had Alan come all the way here to our engineering offices in Paso Robles and sat down with us for a couple of days at my PC particularly, and, and we went through what we really liked about the M2, and we had to marry that to what the customers were asking for. And what the customers are currently asking for is smaller. Mm -hmm. So we scaled this thing down. Uh, the blade length is surprising. It's it, I want to say it's 3.4, mm -hmm. but um, it's very narrow. It's very light. The blade steel is only 3 seconds of an inch thick. Wow. It, it is CPM uh, 20 CV. Right on. And right now with the high grind on that blade, when we sharpen this thing, it's basically a scalpel. <laughs> so I have one in my pocket. Um, last week I decided to skin some some Romex. I had some 12-2 Romex, and I needed to skin about three feet of, of the sheath off of it. And I stuck the tip of that blade underneath that sheathing, and it, it peeled off like butter. So they're not just box openers. These are utility knives that can be used in a variety of dis different situations. And I'm very excited about the DECA. Are you expecting that to be your, your, is that your flagship knife of the upcoming year? Is that, is that one you're pushing hard? Well, this is the 10 year anniversary knife for, for Alan Oishlishowitz oh. and, and Hoag. So DECA is a Greek derivative for 10. Right, right. And that's why we named it DECA. You're saying it's, uh, not just a box opener. These are, these are real hardworking knives. And, uh, the day I got my RSK1, I live in Virginia and we have vines. I mean, you, you cannot turn your back without vines creeping up on you. And, uh, I went out to the backyard to a tree that has uh, just, it's been, it's been overtaken and I devined it with this knife. Uh, it's so sharp and so sturdy. I did it really quickly in, in no time at all. And I felt proud walking in because, uh, you know, I'll admit it. I have a pretty suburban dad life. I don't, I don't do much with the knives I collect other than kind of look for things to do with them. And, and this was a perfect kind of a harder task for my lifestyle. And the knife was awesome. And so I, uh, I, I sent, you know, Doug Ritter's been on this podcast a couple of times. So I texted him congratulating him on an awesome creation and, and how happy I was to finally have it in hand. Yeah, well, we want you to use that knife, and, and honestly, we want you to use all of our knives. The real credo that we've had at Hogue for as long as I can remember, it's like, I'm embarrassed to say it's 35 years <laughs> that I've been associated with the family. The simple edict for every new product is we only make things that we would use ourselves. So we want you to use that knife. So what about this Tomahawk? I have the, I have the EXT01 Tomahawk and and uh, it's it's a pretty uh, tremendous tool. Where does that come in? How how did that come about? Well, once again, that was the, the brainchild of Alan Elishowitz. He said, it's time for you guys to have a hawk. And then I had to understand what that really was. You know, is this a battle axe? Is this a, what is this thing? Right. So, um, no, this is a fighting tool. It's it's in the in the spirit of actually a fighting knife. And uh, Alan could elaborate on the, on the many different handholds. Mm -hmm. One of the handholds puts the two middle fingers right through the, the opening of the head of the blade. And it can be used in, in both a fighting stance and a reverse grip. And, and when used in typical handhold, that little hawk bill at the bottom of the, of the handle is so the thing doesn't fly out of your hand. Yeah, it really keeps it really keeps it firmly nestled in your hand. And actually it has the feel what is it? It's about 13 inches long just so people know, maybe a little less. It's got about a three and a half inch um bearded axe blade that is sharp like uh, acutely sharp like a regular knife blade basically. Uh with a little stouter behind the edge obviously. And then it's got a sort of a hammer pole on the back and uh it really feels like when you when you manipulate it and swing it around, it feels like you've got a uh, a fighting knife in your hand, like a Bowie. It's it it doesn't have that head heavy feel of a, of a normal tomahawk. Yeah, that's correct. It's actually very light, and I, I don't know whether uh, 
you know, tomahawk axe throwing is popular in Virginia, but it's 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 kind of becoming a thing in California. There's actually yeah, yeah. clubs now doing yes, it. Right? Yes, yes, yes. It's kind of the new hipster sport, which is way better than Quidditch. Well, I think so. <laughs> and, and if you've ever thrown a tomahawk, I would ask you to go ahead and throw our tomahawk because, you know, something I took up late in life. I never uh-huh. fancied myself a knife thrower. Right. But I can stick that hawk about four out of five times. Oh, right? cool. <laughs> so actually a quite quite a fun sport. So another uh, unique thing about this tomahawk is the way it uh, the way it fixes itself to your belt. There's a uh, there's a sort of paddle that fits under your belt, kind of in your waistband, like a like a uh, firearm holster. But then the hawk itself locks onto the uh, locks onto the belt uh, holder magnetically, and then has a, another positive mechanical grip that holds it on. It's a really unique way of sto- uh, stowing and carrying this thing around. We really love the sheath, and you know when you think of sheath in the traditional sense, you're 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 expecting to see some sort of a leather pouch, maybe with a strap and a snap, right? And yeah. that just wouldn't do. So again, you know, congratulations, Alan. We're we're honored to execute his vision in, in some of these designs. Uh, the paddle that's that's uh, that goes with the sheath is is made of hytrel, so that is a, a mix mm-hmm. of nitrile rubber. And polymer, which give it it's sort of a soft feel that will, over time, will form to the body. So very comfortable uh, in the waistband. Uh, when I got this, I got this. My brother-in-law was over, it and he's a former Marine, and he he fell in love with it. He's I could have used this. We were breaking windows all the time, you know. I guess what whatever he was doing, and the back of this, he said, would have come in so handy. And I believe it. it, it also, the way this thing locks on, the mechanical lock. Uh, Alan suggested was based on the uh, the AK safety. Is that right? Yes, and you know, leave leave it to Alan to to. to <laughs> I, I would never say steal anything from Mr. Kalishnikov, but leave it to <laughs> Alan to have that sort of depth and see an application, right? So it's it's just it was a brilliant idea. The minute I saw it, I thought, oh yeah, we have to make that. So uh, not cheap. This is not something that you're gonna you know pull up to Big Five and and spend forty or fifty bucks on. But for for the utility user, this this is a really compact package. It's just a great product. So speaking of users, who who are your customers? Who do you who buys your knives? Boy, isn't that a great question? Um, you know, it's a pretty big challenge. You you did touch on it. Uh, we both did touch on it. We sell through distribution, and and what that really means is that I sell most of our sales are to wholesalers. Mm-hmm. So then the wholesalers, they support the brick-and-mortar dealers and, and some Internet dealers. And and what that really means is there's there's margin steps. So there's a wholesale price, there's a dealer price, there's a retail price. The traditional wholesaler has his list of dealers. And maybe he shares those with the manufacturer and maybe he doesn't. So my end customer is everyone. It's everyone mm-hmm. from the custom knife builder or buyer all the way down to the the guy that walks into Big Five and he's looking for something a little bit more than maybe Brand X import knife, and and everybody in between. Well, uh, I know a lot of law enforcement officers, and they all seem to swear by Benchmade. I don't know how that happened. I think uh, not for nothing, but it seems like Hogue is sort of uniquely poised to maybe pilfer some of that from that crowd because they know you through your through your gun products and your firearm products and and you're making a superior knife in my opinion so there you have it what do you see for the future uh for hogue uh knives in particular well we are doing our very best to live up to the brand one of the things that we took very seriously on the first day if we were going to step out of our comfort zone and build a product, it had to have some synergy. It had to have proximity to our end customer, which had its foundations and its beginnings in law enforcement. And the opportunity to sort of mess that up, right, would would not have been something we could have recovered from. For that reason, we didn't try to build a $40 knife. We didn't try to use imported components. We we took the challenge seriously, not only to honor Alan and eventually guys like Doug Ritter and, and anybody else that we might ever work with, but, but to really protect that Hogue brand, which is our lifeblood. 
It's a it's a third generation family business, and we're elated. We're we're really happy that we worked as hard as we did. We took it as seriously as we did. We we looked at every new knife design that Alan handed us, and we put the timetable on it of a wait and see. We never promised. We didn't do any uh, releases that we weren't ready for. Um, sometimes marketing got out ahead of us a few times, and and we weren't ready. And for that, we apologize if ever our customers are waiting. But to answer your question directly, the sky is the limit. We're certainly not here to knock anybody off, uh, not not Benchmade, not not anyone. But we're going to make the best product we can for our customer at a price that we think is fair. And we're going to service our dealers. We protect our dealers ahead of everyone. Love our wholesalers, but our dealers mean everything to us. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. You know, a dealer is has historically been a gun store for us. Well, you can't buy a gun through the Internet. We need that dealer to stay in business. We need that FFL to be able to do legal transfers. So we want that dealer to be in business tomorrow. So I support him. I care about him. The second reason we, we feel so strongly about our dealers is that, you know, if the end user, the retail customer, the guy that really loves that product, in this case, a knife. He has a problem. Where does he go? Well, he goes to the dealer that he bought it from. Or eventually he comes back to me. Mm -hmm. So our customer service is committed to excellence. And we want every customer happy. We want every customer to walk away feeling like they got their money's worth. And if something goes wrong, by God, we're going to stand behind it. We're going to do the right thing. So that's our charter. It's been working. And our knife sales over the past two years, have tripled. We don't know how long that's going to keep up, but we hope for a long time. It's certainly giving us the enthusiasm to go forward. We actually have a lot in the tank. There's, there, we got some new ideas. We got some new products, some new models coming, and we're ooh, the sky is the limit. We're, we're just going to go and go and go until someone tells us to stop. Well, I can't wait to see the new models, and I don't think anyone's going to tell you to stop, Jim. Jim Bruins, thank you so much uh, for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast and talking about Hogue Knives. I really re appreciate it. And uh, to listeners, uh, if you haven't gotten your first taste of a Hogue Knife, you know, if this conversation hasn't convinced you, well, you're nuts. Jim Bruins, thanks so much, and uh, take care. Bob, thank you very much. Have a great evening. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Back on episode number 47 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Jim Person, Bob DeMarco here with you on the Knife Junkie Podcast. Uh, another good interview. And uh, like we said in the intro, Bob, uh, a, a differing uh, angle uh, interview there with Jim Bruins of Hogue. Yeah, uh, it's great to speak to someone uh, with that sort of measured temperament of someone who's had to deal with the manufacturing side and the business side of, of a company. Speaking as an artist myself, it's it's easy when you're making something to to go down that rabbit hole, lock yourself up in your studio or your shop, and um and work on that thing. But when you're out there in the business world and and you're uh, managing a whole bunch of people like that, it's a it's a different kind of perspective. Right. Well, as uh, regular listeners of the podcast know, we kind of end up our show with the Knife Junkies' big takeaway or key thought or whatever. So put put you on the spot again here, Jim Bruins, Hogue Knives, Hogue, uh, kind of what was the, the main thing that, that stuck with you on this interview? Well, I really, really like their product. I really like the company and, and um, the way it's all built in-house. That's how it should be to me. And then speaking with someone as uh, even keeled as Jim Bruins, who knows what's up and where they're headed. It just makes me confident that Hogue is going to be making knives for a long time. And, and that's awesome. <laughs> it's a great way. It's also a great way to get in, get into an Alishowitz for, uh, for less than Alishowitz money too. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that is going to wrap it up for episode number 47 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Do want to thank you for listening. And remember, we told you how to subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you want to get uh, Bob's almost weekly newsletter, be sure to go to thenightjunkie.com hmm. slash subscribe and uh, get his musings and his thoughts on a almost weekly basis for the knife junkie.com or the knife junkie uh, newsletter. So okay, anyway. Jim, you can come out and say it. I haven't written it in <laughs> several weeks. I didn't uh, want to come right out, but all hey. right, all right. I plan on getting back on it. Yeah. So YT subscribe for the uh, videos, subscribe for the newsletter and all that can be found at the knife junkie.com website.
For Bob, the Knife Junkie, DeMarco, I'm Jim Person. Thanks so much for joining us on this edition of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.